Hello, good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening, depending where you are. I'm very happy to be here again, moderating this session, this time with Ocean Citizens and Underwater Gardens International. I mean, we have here a very interesting panel of speakers. We have Mark Duran, he is the founder of Underwater Gardens International. We have Sergio Rossi, the scientific director of Ocean Citizen Projects and also works as, also at the Ocean Underwater under Gardens. And uh, Laura Busquier, she is the technical coordinator of the project. So, I mean, basically we will discuss today, I mean, how, uh, how can we approach both science and society in marine forest regeneration for ocean management protection. I mean, ocean citizen together with uh, underwater gardens, uh, they are developing a very innovative and sustainable protocol for coastal restoration and conservation that should be, that could be later replicable and also scaled up and it was specifically designed for different eco zones. It's a very, very interesting project. So I hope there will be a lot of interactions. We have the presentations and then we have a Q&A part of this session. I mean, please write your questions on the Q&A box. And, uh, but I would like you to start by writing on the chat box, your name and where you come from, so we can understand better who is our audience. So I will start by inviting Mark to talk. I mean, he will introduce her, himself. And uh, well, we are ready for you, Mark. Well, thank you. Thank you for the presentation and the invitation, Jose. And thank you everyone for listening. As uh, Jose was introducing, we have today Sergio Rossi, our scientific director for both Underwater Gardens International and the Ocean Citizen uh, uh, European Project as well as uh, Laura Busquier, who is our scientific coordinator, and she's also in charge of the coordination of the European uh, project and the overall uh, initiative that we are presenting today. So, Jose, I don't know if you want me to start directly on the presentation. Yes, please do. There we go. So, is the, is the screen clear? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Okay. So, um, I, I like this image. I like to, to, to start with this image because we are so obsessed with technology nowadays. Now it seems mm -hmm. like technology is everything we care about. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we forget or often we forget that the most amazing, subtle and marvelous technology is called nature. And I think this image represents it very well. So this nature that has been able to uh, provide life to the planet to make, it, uh, make us exist and to provide a scenario for developing our life and we have been struggling with this relationship with this nature that we belong to, but we don't belong to, and so this through the centuries. And we have superimposed a secondary ecosystem. Not to this primary ecosystem, we have superimposed this economic system, this financial system, which is an abstract, uh, 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 an object of the abstract mind of the humankind, and that has allowed us to uh, produce a relationship between ourselves and between ourselves and the planet. And Somehow we have developed, we have been so successful that nowadays we're facing a crisis due to, to our overperforming and our capacity. This overperforming and capacity also allowed us to change everything. And I believe that we are in, in, in the face of a change of paradigm, uh, obligatory change of paradigm, because the combination of this capacity for technology, this capacity for uh, um, uh, of imp imposing our will into the territory is, uh, is in itself degenerative. So we have this mindset of exploitation from the economic system to the ecologic system. And if we want to subsist, if we want to continue to enjoy the ecosystem services that the uh, eco ecosystem provides us, we need to change and produce uh, business models that are regenerative in nature. Why regenerative? Why sustainable is not enough? Well, being less bad, I think it's a bit late for that. We have to provide to sort of go back into this regenerative and to go back into understanding the relationship, the symbiotic positive relationship that we must design 
uh, within the primordial ecosystem is a new invention, is an evolution. It's not about getting back to where we were, which becomes an impossibility, but to accept the idea that we need to have this continuous interaction, this continuous caretaking of the uh, ecosystem. So underwater gardens understands that we need to start producing this sort of impact, this sort of relationship between the eco economic system, the financial system and the ecologic system. And the key element for having this happening is in a way understanding that every action, individual and collective, produces a legacy. As to remember that we are part of a systemic artifact and this systemic artifact needs to be pilot, needs to be used in a smarter way. So we often say here at Underwater Gardens that we need to fuse the two ecosystems. We need to make taking care of nature uh, financially attractive so that the means to do the action, the proper actions that we need to, to provide uh, and to, to maintain the ecosystem services are financed and we have the means to do so. So in this idea of creating a legacy, we understood that we needed to do three things. The first thing is that if you understand the 20th century as the ecosystem century, in a way that has allowed us to obsess over the subjects of knowledge and to go very deep and to provide us with amazing technologies that we are inheriting from this 20th century. But in the way, we have also, in a way, go away from the wisdom, the, the understanding, the inner understanding of this natural world. So if we want to go back into the right path, we need to put together what has been fragmented in order to evolve and to use it as to cook proper, properly this relationship with, uh, with nature. So in order to do so, we have an entire capacity of the company going into the direction of creating a toolbox, a bio toolbox, which is an invitation for all these dispersed technologies and knowledge around the world to come together Enable to in order to uh, uh, enable us to provide bigger impact and bigger capacity for regenerating uh, nature. So in order to do that, we have in, uh, well, mostly uh, Sergio has done the effort of creating a community of science uh, around this idea of coming together. And at Underwater Gardens, we have developed an instrument, a digital instrument, to in order to orchestrate and to put order and criteria in how to implement the complementarity of this knowledge and technology. We call that the Reef Hopper Protocol. And this Reef Hopper Protocol is a way of going into a specific location, understanding what is the state of the, of the baseline, the state of nature over there, and then provide a specific regenerative action plan. Actually, when we provide this action plan and when this action plan is implemented as a holistic approach, we call those the sea gardens. This idea of the gardener that is in all philosophies, which is the idea of transforming ourselves, transforming ourselves through the knowledge that comes from transforming nature and understanding nature in a very deep level. Obviously, this is very beautiful. And sometimes we get the answer, okay, and how do we finance that? Because one of the problems of science is the way it's financed, how it breaks down uh, uh, careers and, 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 and this, this incentivates uh, uh, very long uh, uh, experimental and, and, and uh, observations of nature. So we have provided an, another instrument. It's an instrument that we call the, the regenerative park or innovation hubs. These regenerative parks are in nature, in a way, a territorial transformator. And I will go into, and this is what this presentation is today is about, the idea of transforming the territory, understanding that the territory is not only the place you step in, but also where you have is the people, is the culture, is the economy, is the natural resources, is the natural ecosystem services, and all of these needs to be uh, taken care of as a whole, as an harmonious uh, uh, totality. So, um, in a way, this integration, this first step of the biotech toolbox, this integration, what we call the Sea Garden, is this sum of technologies and knowledge that can be applied into the different levels of the ecosystem. As Sergio always reminds me, uh, climate change gives us uh, a situation in which uh, the natural ecosystems are gonna be uh, moving around the planet. So this idea of having observation in the long term, having a sensorization 
that is a constant and in the long term makes a lot of sense, mostly if it's related or it's uh, uh, associated to this capacity of intervention. So we can learn from what's going on and we can adapt and we can help certain species to uh, adapt to these uh, rapidly changing conditions. So what you see in the screen, this integrative regenerative plan uh, can go from very deep to very shallow uh, uh, areas. And actually a part of this becomes also an element of the uh, park in terms of how to provide the money that is going to finance all of this. And it has to do with inviting the tourist industry into being part and becoming a force of good instead of keep on being sort of a degenerative force of the territory. All of this uh, implementation is followed by the BioLab, in a way, a local scientific team that is uh, helped by this international community in any doubts and also in the sharing of information. And it's explained to the visitors and explained to the overall society through the Academy, which is sort of a science museum, but not only for nerdy people, but also for the common guy that is in need to understand how to adapt both emotionally and scientifically and through knowledge uh, to this climate change uh, process. So within this frame of the project, we participated in the Ocean Citizen Initiative, which is the pilot part that is uh, founded by the European uh, Commission, that the uh, Horizon Europe project, um, which is in a way helping provide this uh, integration of knowledge into a specific project that is developed in five ecozones, being the, the, the main one in the island of Tenerife, in the Canary Islands. This uh, program, the Ocean Citizens, as you can see in this diagram, is all about the creation of this specific toolbox for these specific locations, is about this idea of creating a new profession, the underwater gardener, and producing uh, this uh, community engagement uh, that allows for this idea that is the community. It is the, the human beings in a specific location, a specific territory that all together have to take care of what gives them life. Um, obviously, as any other Horizon Europe program, we have put together uh, this, this group of amazing scientists and institutions that are come together and, and responded to the call of this idea. And we are uh, developing these work packages actually from underwater gardens, we have the privilege to be part of all of the award packages within the within the program of uh, Ocean Citizen, and we are uh, sort of uh, obsessing into this idea of applicating the same protocol that we have developed, the the same intelligence into these different eco zones, as to test the capacity for this to be applied everywhere, anywhere. The Blue Innovation Hub, as this uh, disruptor for the territory, is in its conception a facility. It's a territorial facility, it's a territorial player. So in a way, I always say it's, a, uh, it's a, an activist at the scale of the territory. So you can face and talk face to face to all the other uh, stakeholders, big stakeholders of, cost, of the coastline. Actually, the Blue Innovation Hub, these regenerative parks are conceived to be uh, developed in mature tourist destinations, because those are the ones that have more issues and, and more problems as to adapt to this new conception of relationship with the environment. They need to understand, they need to be shown that it is possible to have economic activity while not being a degenerative element in the environment. So what's a Blue Innovation Hub? It's a laboratory for climate change adaptation in four levels in the social level, in the cultural level, in the scientific level, and the natural level. Why these four? Because if any of these four fail, the whole, uh, whatever other is failing. Because the, if, you, if you have very good technology and you apply it, but the fishermen or the, the, the surfers or any or, the, or any anyone that's using the sea doesn't care about it, uh, there's going to be a lot of problems of maintenance and sustainability of that application, of technological application. So we need to have all the stakeholders in a state of awareness of the importance of the bottom of the seas, of the importance of this natural uh, ecosystem and the ecosystem services that it provides. So in a way, the collective is taking care of that. 
So in a way, this uh, Blue Innovation Hub, these uh, sea gardens, these underwater gardens, become a new archetype, a new element for the cultural integration of the point of views in a territory. So it's a cultural facilitator. It's a place for education and it's a place for social impact. Actually, this place is developed with two elements. One is the sea garden, which is the installation on the water, and the other one is the garden gate. In a way, the place through which you connect to this reality of the underwater world. This, uh, in our business plans, obviously only one of every five visitors uh, visit the underwater gardens because, as you know, not everyone is fit or wanting to become a diver. But nevertheless, the Garden Gate provides enough uh, experiences, enough open uh, eye opener uh, uh, experiences as to understand and to reconnect with this, to incentivate biophilia, no? as to reconnect the visitor with, uh, with the reality of the importance of the seas. In a way, it's a, you can see this artifact, this innovation hub, which is a laboratory for science, but also it is a tourism product. Uh, in a way, what we're doing is we're providing, in a way, a constant financing to science through the integration of the touristic vector. So we create, an artifact that allows tourist tourism to become a positive element in the environment that provides the nurturing of this scientific facility that is going to finance long-term investigations. We're thinking 50, 75 years, hopefully 100 years, as to provide the data and the knowledge and the inspiration for the next generation as to adapt and to keep on adapting to this climate change adventure. The place, as I was saying, is an educational facility. So it's education and culture has to have this social and cultural impact. And is overall an element that allows for awareness from the administration to the last, uh, to the user, to the visitor. And obviously it's providing jobs, it's providing, it's reactivating economy and it's reactivating economy in a cradle to cradle sense, in a way of circular economy. And in the end, is transmitting this knowledge that natural, the natural-based solutions and, and, and nature is the, the, the wiser and the most amazing technology through games, fun, and learning. Because we don't want to uh, sort of throw the message around uh, of uh, the apocalypse, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's, it's just about celebrating the fact that we are alive. That life is incredible and amazing, and we need to protect it, and we need to be part of, of this protection. The work, I mean, the, the work is started with this conceptual uh, element that I call the, the virtual circle of the three E's. So this territorial facility, the edutainment facility that is uh, creating meaningful vacations because in a way you're gonna, in, a, in our modern societies, tourism is gonna, but is, is just gonna be growing more and more. But uh, we will enter into that in the question and, and, and answer as you go. Um, so we need to transform tourism into another form, into another way of understanding our free time um, and transforming tourism into a regenerative tourism force. This is aligned with the European mindset in this time, uh, the tourism and, and circular, the circular economy one, the, 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 the Green New Deal uh, uh, Europe uh, program. So it's all about circular economy, blue growth, business for good, ESGs, the application for that from the very beginning, not an adaptation, and this return on the investment. So in a way, ecology stops being a center of cost, but it becomes a center of benefits. So this part becomes a financial machine that allows for the payment of the ecosystem regeneration and the coastal management associated to it. It allows for the payment of this long-term uh, climate change adaptation laboratory in the, remember, in the social, the cultural, the scientific, and the natural. It's about monitoring, about creating understanding and data and, and I always say that there's two, two sorts of sensors, no? the technological, wired, uh, electrical ones, but also human beings are the most uh, sensible sensors. So having people watching over this in the long term is going to provide probably the conditions for inspiration and initiatives that we can even foresee right now. So it's about creating the capacity for this to happen and this option observatory and data gathering facility. All of this obviously provides for a nature-based solution capacity for uh, capturing carbon and in a more definitive way. Um, 
the, the, the park or every park is a sensor of climate change as I define it and as a and, and also a speaker for values for adaptation to this climate change. So the more parks we create, the better the network, the stronger the facility, the, the, the stronger the message and the stronger the capacity to create critical data. Um, obviously, as I was saying, this is all about the water cycle that connects us all. It's about understanding how the quality of water in all our, our, our uh, systems is critical and very important for the overall health of every human, uh, uh, every uh, life organism. And this is what's explained both on the water and on land to the visitors. Actually, on land, this garden gate is also a showroom for the most advanced architecture, the most advanced because if we come together with the knowledge that we already know on how to create materials on a cradle to cradle way, on how to do passive buildings that, into, that use the lesser energy possible, how do we produce that energy, how we produce the water, how we produce all of this, this showroom is showing you how you can live already on planet Earth without being a cancer to the ecosystem. So we have a lot of things to do in the park if you're, if you're a visitor and through these things that you do in the park, you're going to start being in touch with the best practices of each and every one of these concepts, from fun to uh, entertainment, nature and regeneration, sports and adventure in terms of health and understanding, recognizing that the outside health of the ecosystem provides your inside health. Uh, how do you eat the territory through gastronomy and being aware of how eating transforms the planet? Pleasure and relaxation as to understand and not to get into panic uh, in front of climate change, art and culture, and over overseeing this transformation. Um, within the core elements in the park, we have the biodiversity center, which is the place where you will be able to experience, see all the uh, metrics that allow you to evaluate how a regenerative park is impacting in the territory, positive, hopefully and uh, negative also as to, so you can do corrections in your path. The Academy is this uh, science museum that is gamified. So through fun, you're gonna understand the basics so that you see your environment in a different way. And the BioLab is sort of the back office of this regenerative park. Um, it is important to understand that the park is an invitation to a journey through your consciousness through your right uh, part of the, of, the, of the brain and your left part of the brain. So the invitation allows you to explore your rational, but also your emotional, your uh, physical world uh, and understand which techniques, which element will allow you to become a more uh, regenerative uh, being instead of, and evaluate if your actions are nowadays maybe a little bit degenerative in nature. Um, actually, this becomes a game. So through fun with your, uh, with your friends, with your family, you go into the park and just as they do in these uh, multi-million uh, uh, games online, uh, depending on your psychological profile, you will live the experience in a different way because you will be choosing and you'll be uh, meeting uh, mind-like uh, people. So if you're very competitive, you're going to find competitive people. If you're very uh, a lonely a lonely ranger, you're going to be on your own. Uh, if you're a socializer or a cooperative person, you're going to play these games and, 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 and go through these challenges that the park offers you in a very different fashion. But overall, the game allows you to understand if you're a degenerative element in nature or a regenerative element in nature. And through this very basic sort of uh, uh, polarization, you can understand and you can be more aware of how to change and how to be part of the change that we all collectively need. Obviously, these experiences are very immersive in nature, and some of them are very analogic, some of them are very uh, digital, but overall, they're at the service, and the park is at the service of providing knowledge over what we understand is the wheel of values for climate change adaptation. So obviously, creativity and responsibility, rigor, science uh, is for everyone. We are all involved in climate change. So we need to develop ecological sensibility and we need to develop commitment through emotions, which is the only way, coherence and nature-based solutions through learning and fun, which is an energy that is positive and is always more engaging and more inspiring as to face the challenges that we face. 
So the first part, this model has been uh, conceptualized first and then the company has been traveling the world trying to understand where to start with the first part. And after uh, several rounds, we decided that Tenerife was the right place. And why is that? Because uh, I don't know if you know, but Tenerife is within the European uh, context, which allowed us to have certain securities in terms of laws and, and, and uh, taxes and et cetera. But it's also one of the most uh, uh, important tourist destinations in Europe. It attracts uh, more than 6.2 million tourists. Nowadays, uh, after the COVID, uh, it's already around these uh, numbers. And you have that, uh, as you can see, there's a, they, they go often, it's, it's, a, it's a good location, it's a good, it's a good uh, destination. But these, as these massive destinations, they have the problem, as you can see, the, 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 the most accumulative uh, part of this tourism out of the 6.2 million, 5.2 uh, stay in the Southwest, in Adeja and Arona, which provides a big impact on the natural ecosystems. Uh, actually, all of these concentrations is within a range of 35 minutes of movement, which means it's really concentrated. And that is both a problem, but also a huge opportunity in terms of the capacity to implement the change that we need in the use of energy, materials, food, uh, waste, etc. So we found a land that was abandoned for 25 years, that also in the sea had been is in the process of degeneration. And we are providing a new model of how to use the coastline. So this is one of the things that we were very proud. We were voted at the uh, Cabildo de Tenerife uh, last year as a Proyecto de Interés Insular, which means insular interest project, means it's strategic, structural, and urgent. So they understand that the model needs to change, the model in which we frame our activity and the equilibrium that we need to provide within our activity and the natural world. Um, in a way, this model, this model, this uh, economical uh, uh, concept is has been recognized, as I was saying you, by the United Nations. So we have become an Ocean Decade project also a uh, little after the declaration of the project of insular interest. And it provides this capacity to rethink uh, the, the, the productive model in the land. Here you can see the location, the specific location. Uh, as you can see, there is a certain dispersion of uses in the territory. Um, if you think of the territory as the way we understand um, our role within the system and how these other sciences, not only the natural sciences, but these other sciences like territorial planning, uh, law, and uh, and uh, product, production, uh, finance, uh, economics are part of the players that we need to align. This is what the project has been providing, a model that uh, is inserted in an, in, in an explicit and already existing way of uh, uh, um, exploiting the territory and allows for an example. Now I'm gonna go a little further on this allows for an example of equilibrium between the parts that are active in the economic system and the parts that are active in the ecologic system. Here, as you can see, is the final uh, um, distribution of land uses within the, the, for the transformation. As you can see, the part that's just in front of the sea is completely defined as regenerative area. We are working with La Universidad de La Laguna, with uh, the, the, the botanical experts uh, of the, the local university, and we are using them, well, we, we are collaborating with them to provide the specific species that also complement the capacity of relationship between the on-land facility and the underwater facility, as to provide a continuity of the ecosystems that the scientists already know that is very is critical and very important. So here we have uh, a Proyecto Interes Insular, which is a new figure. Through the Proyecto Interes Insular, we're pro providing a new figure for the, uh, for the administration of the territory, which is recreational regenerative. So this fusion of these two concepts allows for the implementation of a project in which the uh, business company is in charge of maintaining the local uh, ecosystem. This is the layout of the park, where we have integrated with great architects and urban designers, 
what is the density that an eco a specific ecological system can uh, endure in a specific location. So all of this is a design protocol that can be, uh, that can jump into different locations. And that is the beauty of it. It's super local in a way that the park in Tenerife is responding to specific climate of Tenerife, to the specific materiality of Tenerife, to the specific culture of Tenerife. And this will be very different from a park in some other locations. Indonesia will be completely different. The Caribbean will be very different. Brazil, all the different locations will be a representation of that specific culture and the specific intelligence that is embedded within the already existing culture. Uh, we always often talk in the, in the office, we always talk about cloud architecture. This idea that clouds are not made out of an ego, it's not the expression of something, it's just the it's, it's, it is the expression of the different conditions, the temperature, the wind, and is beautiful. So through the identification of the specificities of a local place, you can define this cloud architecture that is actually expressing the soul of that specific place. Um, again, the place, the, the, the park is thought as a, as, a, as a game. So you have different areas and you're gonna have different activities and invitation through a different journey to understand this capacity of nature. And it allows for the transformation of a, an area that is in decay into a very different way of inhabiting the coastline. Um, this uh, uh, render image that sort of embodies all of these concepts that I've been explaining. Um, and that has been very well received in terms of the integration of the poetics of the, of the place, of the use of energy through the plants that are uh, the best example of technology of using matter and energy to provide life and ecosystem services. Um, I'm not going to go very deep into this. We're both uh, uh, taking care of nature on land and on the water and helping tourism becoming a force of good instead of a continuing to be a force of degradation of the territory. In a way, providing a model that allows the territory to change in all of its levels. Um, making true uh, the capacity to create this idea of legacy, this idea of something that is about taking care of each other and taking care of the natural environment that makes us live. And this is sort of the presentation that we have prepared for today. Um, and I don't know how long it went, but uh, we're open for questions. Oh, thank you so much. We are good on time. We still have a lot of time for questions. Can you stop sharing your screen? Sure. Um, can you all open your cameras as well? Good. Perfect. So, well, thank you so much. I mean, uh, fantastic presentation. I've seen already this presentation and I'm very enthusiastic about this project. It's a fantastic project. We have several questions here. And uh, I will start with the questions, then I have some questions of my own. But uh, well, let's start with Antonio Fernandes. Great idea, creating a new profession, underwater gardener. Which technical skills will be needed to become an underwater gardener? Very good question. That's a very <laughs> you launched this idea, and I will have to follow up on this idea. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Well, actually, the, 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 as you know, when you create a, there's some noise, no? Yeah, yeah. I guess it's Sergio's, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So in the same way that there is a certain culture for creating gardens on land, and there are gardening schools, and you have different... Uh, lines of thinking in these different lines of schools. So it's not the same to study gardening in England than in France. There's a certain tradition on how to make a garden, no? which is also a reflection of a certain culture in the territory. So in the same way, our, what we want is that each and every one of these parks are creating a specific, uh, a specific uh, uh, culture for underwater gardening for every specific uh, location. Because uh, it is more is more about creating a diversity of uh, points of view over this new profession, which is taking care of the terraforming capacity of our seas, 
and hopefully this will emerge as a different as a, as a new profession and and, and and that means that the 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 profile of the gardener is going to be defined through time and through the 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 the, the working of the of the of the of the parks and but that's the approach of the manager and now we're going to hear the approach of the scientist the scientist okay, okay there are several levels. there are several levels for example the ocean citizen we have uh, in the work package six, uh, at the end we have a master for students of, uh, of uh, is a master that will be two years master in which we are uh, developing this kind of uh, different kind of uh, methods and needs for make this gardening. Uh, but for sure also there are other levels which not need to be you know a PhD or a master student or a postgraduate. Uh, this is also contemplated. In the, in the project. So people that has no notion may have a notion and may have a technical, uh, you know, uh, so much, much more a uh, technical uh, per curse, a much more technical way to do this kind of uh, uh, gathering. And yes, for what I understood, you'll be a profession that will have a common start, but then you to diversify. You'll be technical skills, managerial skills, communication skills. Mm -hmm. Basically, I mean, what happens? And we'll hear from uh, from Laura. Yes, um, it's it's in related for what they already said, but it is important to understand that each sea garden regenerates the local habitats and species um, for its height, which means that they have specific needs and uh, specific actions to take care. Um, that's why the underwater gardeners are going to be different for each sea garden. And we need to adapt this general protocol that it will be developed um, to each specific sea garden. And then, as, as Mark explained, in the sea garden, we have um, actions very deep and actions very shallow, which means that we can um, include in this new professional person who people who already have a lot of experience maybe diving or doing scientific collection data underwater, but we can also include people who is starting um, falling in love with the ocean. Maybe they need to try to see if it's something for them or not. So good, basically, you know, as, um, as a coordinator of the Blue Mission that I mean, is taking care of the Atlantic and Arctic Lighthouse and uh, I'm, uh, I'm always looking for solutions there to be scaled up <laughs> and, and replicated in the future. So for what I understood, your core solution will be this protocol. You no, know, the general protocol that then would be basically uh, adapted. I mean, will be, let's say, uh, transformed for each one of the cases and then could be later scaled up. And uh, this is very important because this is a very robust solution that give you a kind of a blueprint where we should go if you in, in the in, for restoration in, in I couldn't say it better of... myself. It's exactly yeah. that, Jose. That's yeah. exactly the strategy we're following. Okay, good, perfect. I, I like to know because you're making a catalog of solutions. <laughs> Yours will be one of the top. So very I... important the way in which we quantify the change that is quantifiable, and then you can test if the change is or not going faster, slower, or is going to the complexity, to the system, to the regeneration of the functionality. This is the, the key of the, of the project. Uh, yes. one, one thing that needs to be understood, Jose, I believe, is the idea that usually you have in AI or in other computing systems, you have a, a, learn, a cycle of learning. No? The computing system learns from its activity and is becoming better and better. So the park is that is translate that concept into reality. So the evolution of specific gardener for a specific location is tied to the park and allows for the implementation of wider uh, restorations in the vicinities or the um, or the specific uh, ecosystems that are similar or uh, closer to that one. Yes, and yeah, indeed. I mean, and sometimes solving local problems is the best contribution you can do to solving global projects, global challenges, yeah. So let's move to the second question. Something that I was, uh, it's always in these meetings, it's about investment. <laughs> it's great presentation so far, 
uh, uh, normally these blue innovation hubs need huge investments. How can the tourist industry pay for that? Here in Panama, this question from Pedro Jimenez, mm -hmm. here in Panama, it would be difficult to find funders, both from public and private sector. How can we overcome this barrier in Panama? Well, I don't know specifically the Panama uh, ecosystem, yeah. <laughs> economic system, so I'm not sure I understand the reasons why it would be hard for them to invest in a, in a profitable business like an underwater gardens park. Uh, we have no, we have not have any trouble so far in our first hub. And uh, we believe that after the preliminary studies on feasibility for specific locations, we might determine if there's a sufficient mass of tourism or a sufficient uh, tourist uh, dynamic for, uh, and, and there's obviously through these preliminary studies, these viability studies, or prefeasibility as they call this, uh, we identify the sizing of the garden that is feasible and possible for a specific location. So for example, in, in Tenerife, we have this uh, 170,000 square meters land, piece of land, which is at the size of the market of Tenerife. Uh, we will have to analyze what's going on in Panama and to understand if, what you need is a very small park or just a lab because the parts of the park can be applied to different locations depending on what's already there. So it's just about the insertion of a specific culture in the, in the tissue of the territory. And the sizing up is very important. It's not, like, it's not like a McDonald's that you do, you put everywhere. You just identify what is the sizing for the specific location through the prefeasibility study. And then you can answer the question. Okay, thank you. Very good way of answering this question, because then you can even build its, these kind of ideas over some existing marine protected areas of uh, existing resorts that still have a lot of to offer in terms of uh, green tourism and things like that. In so it's a of kind of a, imagining. Yeah. Actually, there are two functions for the sea gardens. One is to complement infrastructure that's already in place and needs to compensate for the aggressiveness of their uh, functioning, helping them to transform also. Um, and also it allows for filter, uh, produce a filter. The, the, the diving industry is growing 5% per, per year. We have, depending on the criteria, between 10 to 30 uh, world-class uh, diving areas. And obviously if we have more than 50 million divers in the world and it's growing, uh, this area is gonna be under a lot of pressure. As, yeah. as marine protected areas are. So we need to filter those. We need to sort of create a filter that provides guarantee that the people that enter in the pristine areas or enter in the natural areas are good divers enough. And what's a good diver? A, di a good diver is a diver that has good flotability, good technique. He's not gonna lose himself. He's not gonna break uh, or touch the natural world in a, in a bad way. Uh, but it's also someone that understand understands a human's role in the uh, ecosystem functioning. So yeah. it does not disturb it, but it visited with the, the respect that it deserves. So an underwater garden can help identify if the people are ready to visit the natural area or the marine protected area. And, and even help them to be, to be better prepared if they find some gaps, some, some areas for to, to get better. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, thank you. So another question now from Claudine Alcantara. She's from Brazil, it looks like. What, what's the role of local traditional indigenous communities? What role local traditional indigenous communities could play in the development of underwater gardens? How this idea is transferable to other regions such as Brazil and Northeast Coast, which is rich with corals, mangroves, and seagrass, and these are areas that Sergio knows very well. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. This is a very good question. And it goes directly into the soul of this project. I mean, the idea is to identify, we always say we need to increase intelligence on human action on the territory. How do we increase this intelligence? By you know, recovering the ones, the intelligence we have lost and indigenous people represent that intelligence, that wisdom, if you wish, that needs to be reincorporated and reinterpreted uh, 
has to become part of the main uh, ways of inhabiting the land. That, that is, we, we, I think there is an international understanding of that already, that uh, we have these bolsas, no? um, uh, Pocket. bag, bag, yeah. pockets of, of information yeah, that, have yeah. been, uh, that have passed through time thanks yeah. to these indigenous people. So yeah. that needs to be complemented and it's integrated, as I was saying, because of cloud architecture approach or the cloud architecture approach, the indigenous knowledge and wisdom is part of that uh, stakeholder that needs to be represented and it's integrated in the design of the each part. It's interesting your question because last week we had a very interesting networking Friday on the mangroves in Brazil. I'm the presenter and she's, she's here now and she introduced I mean, the idea of the linkage between the, the I mean, the supernatural sober, sober, world, world in helping to manage in these areas. So she talked about Yemanja and many other deities that really helps and give people some ideas of how to manage. And But Sergio looks like he has much more to say about that. Uh, yes, I, well, I, I... Take advantage to say hello, Yara. This is the other side in this moment in Brazil. He knows me a little bit because we met in, uh, in, in Rio de Janeiro. But it's, it's truth. I mean, uh, recently we published with the uh, Universidad Federal do Ceará a paper in which, uh, with uh, the, the, the leadership of Lidiana de Sosa Pinheiro, uh, we published a paper in which the indigenous people was involved, for example, in their cartography, the underwater cartography, the habitat cartography. And oh. in other in, in, years, we made a very in-depth, uh, you know, uh, work in which we we try to put on the table those ecosystem services which are not, cannot be translated in monetary. So those that are uh, cultural <clears throat> or that are related with and so on and so on. And this is one of the main aims of the project, involving people from the beginning and uh, involving all this know-how that uh, was uh, uh, the mark told uh, in the in the last few minutes. There is, I, I may add that the sp spiritual dimension of a specific territory is actually and uh, absolutely very important for the territory. It's part of the social and the cultural level, and uh, and and it it, it describes or uh, reveals. Uh, the secrets of a specific ecosystem from a very different way than uh, modern science does. So the complementary, uh, um, the complementarity of these two views is important, I believe, to put everything for the regeneration process. Yes, thank you. Let's move on because we still have a lot of questions and we don't have much time. So the question from Valerie de Liederkerk, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. The question for Mark. In your opinion, what other stakeholders might be invited to be a force of good? I could see maritime spatial planning authorities as stakeholders and financiers via marit maritime sectors that they partnered with. That's, that's an excellent question. And as I always say, uh, the solution is holistic and is integrative and is cooperative. So the... There is like a, a growing uh, process, a learning process on how to incorporate stakeholders. So uh, the park does that at the territorial level. So obviously we have, for example, in the Tenerife project already some institutions and some industrial uh, companies that are joining the initiative and providing also their knowledge and their, and their understanding on how to manage the specifics of the park. So the invitation is open and the, 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 the conversation allows for the identification if the possibility for the integration of new stakeholders is possible or not. As a, as a, as a philosophy, as a system, the more we are, the more intelligence we can gather, the more energy we can put into creating this and making it happen and, and being successful. Well, that's a very good response. Thank you. And... So we move to the next questions. It's from Pedro Jimenez, from again sorry. from Panama. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. Okay. No, it's sorry, fine. sorry, Laura. I didn't see That's your all right. hands raised. It's okay. Yeah. Just to add a small thing. Um, so being like 
full in concordance for uh, which will Mark just said, um, within the ocean citizen, um, from the beginning, when we were considering the proposal, we really understood the, the importance of um, understanding and including stakeholders. So not only informing them, but engaging them um, within the project. And that's why within the Ocean Citizen, this work package um, skeleton that Mark showed a few minutes before, um, within two of the work packages, stakeholder engagement and information is included, which means that it is not an isolated task that we do. It, it is like two or three tasks that we have between the different tasks so we can include the stakeholders in the different parts of the project. Like, but in the beginning in the evaluation, during the uh, implementation phase, and also during the um, monitoring phase of the project. Yeah. So they really participate in all that and probably they'll participate in the future in the impact assessment and the results that were That's achieved. what we expect, yes. Yeah. yeah, that's very important. So we have, I mean, Pedro Jimenez from Panama, he's very active today. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, I mean, all this edutainment will be digital or people, namely youth, will le really learn by living the experiences in real life and, and working on site with their own hands? These are very good questions. Excellent question. And yeah. so, uh, it's true. Uh, sometimes I, I don't realize how fast I go into presentation, but I was trying to convey the idea that no, no, no. A digitalization is just a part of it. In, in our projects, we understand that there are two levels, the digital and the human, as expressions of these two technologies, the natural and the technocratic, in a way. But none of superior to the other, in a way. Mm -hmm. It's a very strong idea. We are not to be submitted, or, or uh, uh, AI or these technologies, immersive technologies, are not on top of humans. On the contrary, they're just, they're just, just a tool. So in order to provide the conditions for living directly in the natural experience, these are enhancer or uh, some, a companion that allows you to go deeper into your, uh, uh, into your understanding of the land you're visiting. But the, the whole experience of the park, the, the idea of having a piece of land and to visit this piece of land is precisely to make people uh, take the youth and, and everyone out of their homes, out of the screens, and into nature again. So they can have the direct experience because it's through the direct experience, the spiritual experience of this direct experience that you understand and you incorporate the importance of nature. Oh yes, exactly. There's no substitute for a real life dive into the ocean. You know, then you experience really all the senses. It's very important. Thank you. And then we have Antonio Fernandez, very interesting presentation, fantastic project how this project could be replicated in Cabo Verde. We are very close to Tenerife. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> and Santo Tomé oh. Principe, a little further south in the Gulf of Guinea. That's a good question, so. Well, uh, as, uh, probably the, the best way to do this is please call me and we start the process of identifying the, we can do the pre-feasibility study and with this profitability study, identifying the viability, the, if the financial, the natural, the scientific viability of the project, the sizing up. Is this, if this could be a big project, this could be a small project, because the idea is that we have big projects because there are like these tourist uh, destinations that are have very active. And then there are satellites elements so that we can provide a network of sensors of what's going on on the different approach of gardening. So it's, it's the creation of a network of sea gardens. So yeah. obviously every location is interesting, every location is important, and we can adapt the protocol to every location within certain limits, obviously. So we need to identify first if the limits are there or if it's a possibility. And very important, we don't go in pristine areas. Pristine areas are to be protected. We go in areas that have already been degraded. So we can compensate, we can regenerate. And that regeneration, uh, some, uh, you know, help the overall health within the marine protected areas and these new sea garden capacities. Um, I want to extend this answer into the idea that as, as we 
you know, we have this sort of military conception of uh, a business and the way we occupy the territory. We impose our business model into the territories. In our case, we add the layer of listening first to the state of the natural world. So the natural world is... So the next question that is, did you perform the environmental impact assessment of your intervention in Tenerife? Did you find a negative impact of the constructions? Okay, so we need this articulated answer. Yes, yeah. we are we are going through right now the evaluación ambiental estratégica. What yeah. we already know is that the, the the part in the sea is a positive impact, can only be defined as positive impact, and the one on land has the difficulties of, because you know there's an inertia in the in the in the, in the, in, the, in the low corset that you have to develop your buildings, etc. So even though there are certain technologies or certain designs, passive designs that will make the uh, the environmental um, uh, effect uh, uh, lower, because the, the norms do not allow you to apply them, you you are a little harmful, a little bit. But it's compensated by the regenerative area, the specific regenerative area. So the, the overall sum is positive. Good, good question. And so, I mean, we are very close to the hour, but we have another question from Marie Therese Oshir. It's amazing idea and appreciate the local context. Can you take research visitors to your site in Tenerife? It's already yes. people <laughs> invited themselves. If, she, if you say yes, I'll be there very soon as well. <laughs> Well, that, that's not, not for you to answer because it's, it's Laura that's in charge of that. So she wants to prove or not that someone visits. Uh, we are doing right now, actually in September, we'll be uh, diving and, and doing uh, uh, a part of the work with uh, at the Ocean Citizen and, and from our own uh, scientific team. And I don't know, I will say send, send us uh, an email, uh, contact, and we'll discuss. And, and see if we can arrange because the boats are already full, I believe. <laughs> Perfect. I will put I will put Marie Therese in contact with you. But Maybe. something something just to add, um, the bio lab, which will be this um a lab that we will have on land to support the sea garden, it it is contemplating the idea of, of course, um being coordinated with other research groups so we can. Um, include researchers from different parts of the world. So it has to be like, like the name it has, no, like a hub of knowledge that we can conversate and, and, and know for each other. Like this is not um, something we, we can do it right now, but yeah, it will happen. And of course, if, if any of you will want to contact us and see the manner that we can um, collaborate like now or in the future, we will be more than happy to do that. Yeah. Before we close, I just received an email, uh, a, a question from, from a friend. He's based in the Maldives. And, <laughs> and he was watching and through YouTube and asking the same questions. Is, it, Maldives is a very fragile environment, as you yes. might know. So would this be also replicable in areas that are, they are not pristine, but there are some areas that are very well conserved? Uh, mm -hmm. Would it be possible to replicate in areas such as Maldives these beautiful atolls and I mean and, and floating islands basically? I, I will say uh, this is the way we proceed. As a doctor, will go and uh, check the health of the patient, and then, <laughs> and then understand if it needs uh, an aspirin or it needs uh, surgery. So what we do is that we do first an assessment on the health of the specific location that is a target for, of interest. And depending on the conditions, the legislative conditions, the natural conditions, you know, this matrix of conditions that we, uh, that through our protocol, we have defined and we, that we measure. Once we measure, we have the state of the location and then we decide if it makes sense or not to do an intervention there. But so, I mean, before we close, I would ask you a, a final round of comments. If you want to say something before we close, we start with uh, Laura. 
Would you like to say something for us to close this session before we close the session? Sure. Well, I'm so first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting us. Um, I was also checking the messages that people was leaving in the chat, and I want to thank you all first for being here. I mean, I know it's lunchtime for most of us. Uh, so thank you very much for being here and for your nice words, because um, this is like a lovely journey, but sometimes um, we really appreciate having like nice words um, so we can keep moving um, forward. And yeah, that, that will be all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, I mean, Laura. Sergio, well, would you like to say something? I, I also uh, am really happy to, to have this opportunity to make this uh, this talk from Mark that has, <clears throat> you know, of this holistic vision of the project, much more than me because I'm a scientific uh, director of Ocean Citizen and then I just have the bias to go to the scientific and the technological application of the, of the tools that we are, and also the ecosystem that we are uh, talking about. And I'm very happy to, to, to say that this project is, uh, yes, it's unique, it's articulated, has many, not only many work packages, but all the work packages and all the tasks are uh, synchronized. It's very important that everything is synchronized. Everything is going, uh, you know, if it's going well, is going in a well mood. And uh, well, uh, I'm very, very anxious to see the results from the Arctic to the Red Sea, uh, passing, of course, uh, to do the Tenerife Island. Thank you so much. So, Mark, your yes. last words before I close the session. <laughs> we are waiting right. for more inspiration from you. Everybody was really, really inspired here. I mean, a lot of good comments on your uh, intervention and the comments by Sergio and Laura as well. well th uh, thank you very much. I mean, uh, what I can say is that this is a project that was born out of, uh, out of love out of love of uh, our environment, out of love of the sea, and uh, out of this preoccupation that maybe we were not doing the right things. No? And, and hopefully this initiative uh, allows us to um, put together like the right people. So this is an invitation. I mean, to me, one of the reasons I wanted, or I was excited to be here today is the idea that underwater guidance is about cooperation, is about the, the sum of the different so if every, anyone feels impelled or inspired us to be part of this adventure, please contact us and, and let's work together towards this future that we want. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you again, Sergio, Laura. Thank you for all the attendees, for all the people that asked questions or posted comments here. I mean, this, this uh, recording will be soon available. And then you can share with other people. There are a lot of people here, the attendees that I know, I'm sure, will contact me later about how to connect with you specifically. Just to let you know, Sergio Milton Campbell from IMP is over here. And we are going to, to the Space Week in Fortaleza in a, in a few weeks. I'm sure they will contact Love Omar and try to, to organize with you something over there. So again, thank you so much. Thank you uh, the, the best for Ocean Seeds and for, I mean, Underwater Gardens International. We will do our best to promote the project, to promote your ideas, Mark. They are, uh, all of your ideas is there, fantastic. And you put your soul in contact with all the people that ask for more information. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, Jose. So, thank, thank you, you so much. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.